o'clock. So hello and welcome to this FMB webinar, which is the first of our autumn 2024 season. Um, thank you for making the time to join us today and to be with us for this webinar. I think you're going to find the content today to be extremely useful, no matter where you are in relation to public sector tendering at the moment. If you're looking to improve what you do or you're just thinking of uh, dipping a toe in that water, then you're going to find some useful, useful information shared here today. So um, I'd like to introduce our speakers for the day, who are Nigel Dennison and Kate Skillman from Gimlet Associates. And Gimlet have a very simple objective, which is to provide cost-effective bid writing and tender support services that help their clients to win contracts, which is probably one of the most straightforward company objectives that I've seen. It's really clear. It says that you do exactly what it says on the tin. Um, and they've helped SMEs to win contracts from uh, for SMEs and micro businesses right up to multinational corporations. So they've got a lot of experience and information to share with you today. So first, I want to go through um, some bits of housekeeping. So there are some quite detailed slides that have a lot of information in them, but don't worry about trying to note everything down because we will send you a follow up email after the webinar, which will have a PDF of the copies of the slides with all the information in there. Um, the webinar will take about 40, 45 minutes. The presentation part will be half an hour or so, and then there'll be time for Q&A at the end. So if you have any questions as we go through the presentation, please just type them in the Q&A box. If you hover your mouse at the bottom of the screen, you should be able to see that. Pop your questions in there and we will um, do our best to answer as many as we can at the end. And there's no such thing as a stupid question is an important principle to bear in mind, because if you're thinking of a question, somebody else probably is as well. Um, so that's the housekeeping out of the way. And I am going to before I hand over to our speakers, I am going to launch a poll, which is to find out really to give you in the audience a chance to tell us where you are in relation to public sector tendering at the moment. So that hopefully you can see the questions on the screen there now. Um, and they're asking you, where are you in relation to public sector tenders? Have you already won some and you're here for a refresh? Um, have you bid for such uh, contracts in the past with mixed success and need to improve your win rate? Or have you not yet bid for public sector work and you're here to learn a bit more? So I'll just leave that on the screen for a moment or two to give people a chance to read those and respond. And I can see that people are still clicking on those, so I'll leave it there a bit longer. OK, I'm going to end that poll and just share the results on the screen. And you can see that most of the audience. Can you see that, Nigel and Kate, as well? Yeah. yeah. Yes, we can. So most of the audience, 73 percent, haven't yet bid for public sector work. So they're here to learn a bit more about that. And a few have bid with mixed success already. So that's really good to know. Thank you for completing that. And I'll now hand over to Nigel. Um, and we'll get the presentation up on the screen. Thank you. Thanks very much, uh, Hayley. Um, well, whilst the um, the bid is going into um, presentation mode, um, we, over the next 30 minutes, we're going to have a real canter through um, producing compelling bids. It's quite a big subject. So what we aim to do um, today is to give you some main pointers which will help you, particularly the 73% who've never never bid um, before, to give you some ideas, some thoughts uh, about how you might approach the whole thing. Um, I, I think it's worth saying that um, bidding is not a dark art, but it can be bureaucratic, it can be time consuming, and it does require, require a degree of organisation uh, and preparation if you're going to be successful. There is a process which we found that if organisations generally follow they tend to be more successful than those who don't have any kind of process and, uh, and, and proper approach. We're going to be talking today about public sector opportunities rather than private, but the things we talk about are also applicable to any private sector opportunities that um, you might, uh, might have. So this afternoon, we're going to talk specifically about cherry picking the right opportunities, uh, taking the right action 
when a bid is um, published, preparing to bid uh, and producing a high quality um, submission. And so hopefully this will, um, will be of some use to you. So can we have the next slide, please? So there are thousands of public sector contracts which are published throughout the year. And I would guess that construction related uh, contracts um, are amongst the most frequently um, listed tenders. And so you, you'll know from your probably own experience, so you'll get everything from, a I don't know, a multi-million pound hospital to the refurbishment of a primary school for under 50,000 um, pounds. But it's important that you take a really cold, hard look, a realistic look at your own organization to assess what it can do today, what it might be able to do tomorrow, and what steps are needed you need to take to get your organization from today to tomorrow and to being able to bid. Um, it's on, also understand, important to understand what sort of opportunities that your organization um, can and might want to undertake. Um, and you need to be really quite realistic about that, um, those that thought process. It's important to know wherever you can, who the sort of buyers, public sector buyers are that you might want to approach uh, and what their priorities are. You might find that on websites, you might find it out on Meet the, uh, meet the Buyer Days, um, but the aim is wherever you can to be proactive and not reactive. Um, you want to try and anticipate when a bid is, to, is likely to come out rather than responding to it when it's published. It does put you on the front foot, but it is easier said than done and there's a bit of work involved. Next slide, please. So one of the first things I would say to anyone who has ne never had any experience about um, public sector bidding is to go to see what, what they are. And Contracts Finder is a free resource, government resource. Um, and it lists all public sector opportunities in England um, over, I think it's actually rather than 10,000, I think now 12,000 has gone up. Um, and there are similar sites in Scotland, Wales and Northern Ireland, which we'll come on to a bit later. And there you can search for opportunities listed in different sectors. You can find out what's coming up in the future. And very importantly, it allows you to search and uh, look for bids that have come up over the last five years and have been awarded. That enables you to see what the profile of the market that you're interested in is. You can see who the successful bidders are. You can see the contract price. So it's a very useful um, way of getting a feel for what sort of bids will be right for you. You can create an account. You can get all these opportunities in particular areas sent to you. But I do caution you, you will get a lot of useless information as well. So it does need weeding quite extensively. But there will be nuggets in there um, for you. Um, so uh, can we have the next slide, please? Very similar idea is some, um, you might well have heard of Find a Tender, which is the big, big brother to Contracts Finder. And essentially it lists all tenders over 138,000 pounds, which will be a lot of contra um, construction contracts, obviously. Uh, and in there, you again, you can search, identify, um, uh, previous um, uh, tenders, et cetera. So I would say those two um, uh, portals, but those two, not portals, those two sites are really important for you to understand what the opportunities are so that you can start to define what the right opportunities for your organization are. Next slide, please. Now, this slide is, we've listed just a selection of the um, portal, free portals, and sites where you might go to find opportunities. Opportunities. So you can see there's extensive ones. I'll point out there's Public Contracts Scotland, Sell to Wales and East Sourcing Northern Ireland, um, if you're in different parts of the country. But all of these in one way or another will um, show you opportunities. So you need to identify which ones are the best ones for you. It may be regional, or if you're a national operated um, company, um, maybe look at some of the ones um, up at the top. But essentially, the main thing is that um, you need to be judicious about how you select um, opportunities. Um, those companies that tend to try and go for everything will end up winning nothing. So it's important to understand, as I said earlier, about what your particular skill sets are, what you could undertake, 
and what's best for your for your company. Um, my experience and Kate's experience is that um, if you try and bid for more than one contract at a time, you will you will bear the scars for months of, uh, um, afterwards. It's very difficult to do. So you do need to be selective, I would suggest, about how you approach um, taking on opportunities. Next slide, please. So timely decision making is um, is important of, um, in um, in bidding, as is answering these really important decisions uh, or questions. So before you embark on any kind of um, bid or you decide you're going to express an interest, you need to ask yourself, can I win it? Can I deliver it? Is it going to be profitable? Is it actually in line with my business strategy? Or am I sticking to the knitting? And if you can answer yes to all of those questions, then you probably should bid. It's a, it'd be a good use of your company time, and you're obviously in with a chance. If you answer no to any of those, you need to be able to fill that gap so that you can answer yes. But if you answer no to any of those questions, I would suggest, unless there are very good reasons, you probably shouldn't be bidding, um, unless, as I said, unless there's a very good reason. Uh, next question, please. So really what you're trying to aim to do is rather than snatch that whole bunch of cherries, is go for the biggest, juiciest cherry, which you know that you can bite off. Um, particularly, I think that's relevant for smaller businesses. If you're a big organization with a big team and you've got multiple divisions and what have you, clearly you might be able to go for more than one. But for a smaller business, you should be thinking about cherry picking. Next slide, please. OK, so you've identified that cherry. It's been published and um, you've got all the documents. So this is the first time I would point your uh, draw your attention to the egg timer. Um, bidding is time sensitive. You have to submit your tender um, within a designated time period. Otherwise, that's it. The, the opportunity is gone. We've had some clients who um, can rung us up saying, oh, can you help us with a bid? It's, um, it came out three weeks ago and is due in, in 10 days. All I can say is that the later you leave it, your chances of a successful and compelling bid are significantly reduced. So start early. You're going to get documents, which you, you must read all the documents in, in, in the pack that is sent out. And those will generally be instructions to bidders, a specification, a pricing document usually, a quality and technical responses, and those are the exam questions really, and terms and conditions. Documents that you need to complete will generally be a pricing document, quality and technical responses, a standard questionnaire, which will ask you all the various details about your company or your organization, um, various policies, your insurance and so on. There'll be a form of tender, which you're signing up to um, honour your um, tender price for usually 90 days, could be 120. And also a social value response. And I'll talk a little bit about that in a moment. So you're trying to, what you're trying to do is to understand the contract. Somebody must understand the contract in your organisation. And if you don't understand the contract, you need to ask um, the um, authority uh, questions about it. Next slide, please. So clarification questions are a really important area of bidding and they they can shape contracts. They can you, you might have a, a, a tender in front of you. You think oh, I can't possibly do this. But remember, remember that the people writing the tenders, they're human. They make mistakes and they make mistakes more often than you might realize. And so if they you push, you should push back if there's a clear error. If you don't understand something, you must always push back. Firstly, you need to read the documents to make sure you're not, you know, you, the, the, the answer isn't already there. But if anything is unclear, you should always ask a question. You should also always follow the process that they've laid down about asking a question and submit that clarification question early. Look at the, the, the egg timer on the left there. Um, because there will be a deadline for questions. And so you need to get the questions in and answered so you've got plenty of time to shape your responses. 
So the purpose, and which is highlighted in the middle, middle in green there, is to use um, clarification questions and their responses to confirm your understanding of the requirement. Only ask one issue per clarification question. If you want multiple questions in a single sentence, they will guarantee you they will only answer one of your questions. So keep them separate, keep them clear and concise. Don't reveal who you are or what your organization um, is. Um, don't sign it off, you know, cheers, Jim from Acme Construction. Um, keep it professional and, uh, and anonymous. If you need to ask a confidential question, you put that in the title and uh, of the question that you want to ask. And if the response is unclear, push back and ask another clarification question. Um, they're extremely useful and an essential tool in bidding. Next slide, please. So one of the things, again, um, it, this, this comes rather before, but also can be um, part of the whole bid process, is somebody in your organization, and look at that time, that uh, uh, egg timer again, you need to really get this sorted out before the bid arrives. Um, someone is going to have to develop the solution. Somebody's going to have to write the responses. Somebody's going to have to manage the bid and administer it and administer the questions. Ideally, someone's going to need to review the response to make sure it actually is answering the question. Somebody's going to have to do the cost modeling, usually the estimator in, in uh, the construction world. And somebody's going to have to sign it off saying, yep, yeah, I'm willing to enter a contract to deliver this particular service um, or system. So that can be multiple people or in a small business, it might be one person. Um, but nevertheless, you need to understand and be able to undertake all of those roles. And if you can undertake all of those roles, then you're probably good to go. Next slide, please. Um, the last piece here is that um, ideally, I would cre create a bid bank, encourage organizations to, um, to get, get all their systems and processes in place so that they, they know what, what it is they're going to do and, and that they're able to demonstrate. If you look at the top of the slide there, governance, quality, and standards. These local authorities, a, a local uh, procurement officer once said to me, he said, we do not want a man with a van and a barrow. Um, and so these questions that they ask are designed to screen out those sorts of organizations. So you need to be credible and you need to demonstrate that you're credible during the bid. So you'll be asked for basic company information and data. You may be asked for a series of policies and procedures. So that might be, for example, um, we had to write extensive information and data security um, Info, uh, policies for a, a, a construction client um, who is working for an insurance company. Um, accreditation. Um, there's not many local authorities who will let a, a big construction uh, project to anyone who hasn't got in, um, construction line gold. Um, sustainability and social value. This will be an area, and you might want to ask about it in questions, which is growing in importance. You will need to be able to demonstrate the sustainability of your organization and how you add social value to, um, to your local area. This will take 10% of the marks in the quality section. Um, so it is an important area. You can also aim off um, for typical response requirements. You know that you're going to probably get asked about your health and safety. You know you're going to probably get asked about how you're going to manage um, access to the site, how, how you're going to um, uh, make sure that the local um, community aren't um, inconvenienced by, by your, your work, for example. Each, and depending on the, you, the circumstances, you'll be able to understand what sort of questions are going to come up and you'll be able to aim off and start the preparation of how you might do that. And then evidence of capability. That might be the references, previous uh, jobs. It might be your CVs of uh, you and your employees. Um, but all of these need to be in place uh, before the bid um, starts. Next slide, please. So in very simple terms, before you start bidding, you need to get your ducks into a row. Thank you very much. I'll uh, Next slide, please. And over to you, Kate. Thanks very much, Nigel. 
Um, what we're going to look at now is how to actually produce your bid um, in a way that is as pain free as possible. Um, everybody has day jobs to do it unless they have a dedicated bid team where the bid team will just crack on with a bid. Um, and obviously what you need to do is when the tender comes out, be able to do it um, as seamlessly as possible whilst your business keeps ticking on and achieving its day to day activity. Uh, could we have the next slide, please? So we have the key quality principles, what I would call the holy trinity of C's, the compliance, content and consistency, which are absolute fundamentals in any successfully produced bid. First of all, and fundamentally, obviously, you have to show how you are complying with the specification that the employer releases um, within the tender documents. You're going to be writing not what you simply want to write about and what you want to tell them, but you're going to be complying with the specification that the employer has very carefully produced and with the questions that the employer is asking. You must comply with the instructions of the tender and the instructions of each and every question and component part of the question. So it's really important to familiarize yourself with the instructions throughout the whole tender before you even start picking up a pen. So identify where the question, where the instructions are and go through them and be absolutely familiar with them. In terms of content, what the employer is looking to see is information written by a supplier, which is well written, nice and clear, and shows all the information articulately that is requested. I always recommend producing one fact per sentence so that the sentences are short, sharp, and focused. It makes it a lot easier for the reader to read and the reader is going to be the evaluator. So therefore it makes it a lot easier for the evaluator to give marks on the content that you have produced. You need to substantiate your content with evidence and data. Evidence that shows that you can do what you say you can do rather than simply leaving it as an unevidenced fact. Um, evidence could be a testimonial, it could be evidence of in a year you have achieved um, you have um, achieved so many um, whatevers you have achieved, um, but it's clearly written evidence that, as I say, substantiates what the question is asking and it evidences your capability. Um, when you are crafting your content, um, check the evaluation criteria of the tender. We'll look at this in a minute, um, but the evaluation criteria of a tender has been, again, it's been put together very carefully to align with the, the tender's questions. Um, and the expectation will be for you to fulfill what the evaluation is after. And the, the, from our experience, bidders who have shown that they have reviewed the evaluation criteria are those who produced the clearest and the most comprehensive, highly scoring answers. So I thoroughly recommend looking at the evaluation criteria. In terms of consistency, when the evaluator is looking to mark your tender, the responses, the written responses, um, and the quality of them, they're looking to see that it is from, the, uh, to see as though it is written by the same person in every single response. There's a strong chance that different people will have written different quality responses. But when you are preparing to submit or preparing to review before submission, you need to check through and make sure that your writing style across the responses is very consistent and in the same writing style, paying particular attention to the spelling, punctuation and grammar so that you're presenting your business in the best possible light. It's easy to forget in the hurry of doing a tender and the time scales that you've got that you are not doing it just to get the tender done. You are doing it to really showcase your business because the employer is obviously looking to award a contract which could be thousands, millions of pounds, and you need to show that you are worth it. Every bit of quality counts. In terms of structure, within all of your written responses, make it easy for the reader to chew through them. If you can imagine how easy it is to read a page of printed text which has no paragraphs, no bullet lists, it's just a solid 
page of content that is not good to read. You would switch off and fall asleep very quickly. Break it up, subheadings where you can to draw, um, draw the eye, to draw focus to certain areas, bullet lists to summarize content. Um, in, be creative how you present it. You may choose to do information as tables if you're allowed to, um, if you're not submitting directly via portal, if you're submitting in Word, use tables, use diagrams if you're allowed to, but do make it easy for the reader, keep their attention, hold their attention, um, and make it interesting. Next slide, please. In terms of the evaluation criteria, as referred to earlier, I would advise any bidder to only look at the top two levels of evaluation. You can see from here, this is a typical evaluation table, um, ranging from excellent to unacceptable. Excellent exceeds the requirement of every question. Good satisfies the requirement with minor additional benefits. Acceptable satisfies the requirement. So the difference between excellent and acceptable is really quite large. The difference between a five score in every question and a three score would so easily be between, you know, pass and, well, winning and definitely not winning. The winning bidder, from experience, the winning bidders will be those who can score maximum score in the majority of questions or maybe maximum with a smattering of goods. When you're crafting your responses, check the evaluation criteria. And if you find that having looked through the questions in the tender, you can only do, you could only score acceptable or below, reconsider whether your time would be better spent doing other business activities. There is no point submitting a tender that is acceptable. If it is good, that's fair enough. If it is excellent, then you're on the winning streak. But do judge yourself objectively and your capability to respond in terms of content against the evaluation criteria. Next slide, please. So in terms of actually drafting the responses, um, there are several ways which I find make it a whole lot easier. It's never going to be easy, don't get me wrong, it's never going to be easy, um, but there are ways of making it easier for yourself and anybody else who might be supporting you with your bid. So first of all, you create a separate Word document for each extended quality response that you're looking to produce. So let's say you have got a tender and it's got 10 extended responses. So you're going to have 10 Word documents, one for each question. In the header section of the Word document, you're going to copy from the tender document the actual question wording and paste it into that header. Um, and by doing that, every time you write and it goes onto a new page, the question will remain in front of you and it'll stop you from deviating from what the question's asking. It'll stop you from forgetting what the question's asking. It will keep you on track as a constant reminder of what each question is asking as you're forming a response. When you're actually preparing to write your, your response, break down the question into bite-sized chunks. So it, it's like that, that adage of how you eat an elephant. Well, you eat an elephant one mouthful at a time. You break down your tender response into bite-sized chunks. Um, so you're going to, first of all, separate out the instructions of the question and then highlight the themes of the, the content, the actual subject matter. I'll show you an example shortly. And whilst you're thinking about the questions, again, go back over the specification, reaffirm your knowledge of what each question is after. So for example, if you've got a question on health and safety, go back into the specification and look at what the employer is actually asking about health and safety so that you know that when you're going to write your response, it's going to be aligned with what the requirement is, not simply what you want to tell them, but aligned with what the employer wants to hear and obviously make sure that you're showcasing in that tone. Next slide, please. So in terms of the 
um, methodology, how to answer a question. We call this deconstruction. And what we have here is an example of a question uh, from a construction tender uh, from York City Council. And believe it or not, this question, which is eight lines, is a single question, um, or it, it was numbered as a single question. But let's look at it more closely. It is actually not one question. Um, without meaning to be boring, I'm going to read it up through so we can just do a bit of analysis as we go. So the actual theme, team structure and project experience. So it's all about your team and the project as the focus of the specification. Provide an organization chart for your proposed team, clearly identifying the full team, including both site and office-based personnel, and identifying key operational and administrative contract contacts for the specified project. So there's lots of ands there, lots of component parts. Provide information highlighting your team's technical skills and previous experience. Full CVs may be provided and do not count towards the word count. Please provide reference to two relevant construction products completed within the last five years, providing details of your company's experience as the main contractor, taking account of the project's scope, scale and complexity. Responses are to include name of the project, location, client, value, form of contract, start and completion date. Final instruction, 1,000 words. Well, hey, the question's getting on for quite a few words anyway, so let's see how we can tackle a response whilst looking to get it into 1,000 words. This was a tricky one, I will I'll grant you that. Next slide, please. So first thing we do is we break it down into the component parts, make it a little bit more palatable. We've got the first chunk, which is all about the organizational chart. And then the second chart is the requirement to provide information highlighting skills and previous experience. Now, whilst we're looking at the second part here, something to note, which is gonna make your life easier if you have a question like this. The word may, full CVs may be provided and do not count towards the word count. Well, hooray, that's brilliant because the word count is only a thousand words, which is not a lot. Um, and you are allowed to put in CVs as extra without them counting to the word count. So that, that is really useful. If you ever see something like that, I strongly recommend taking it up. Um, and then reference to two relevant construction projects within the last five years, with lots of nuts and bolts there on the requirement within the question. It doesn't say how you can present this. So what I would suggest is be creative, present it in a compelling way, and then you can make it again easy for the, um, we've got a message, the slide has not progressed. Um, right, if I can pass that back to the team. Yeah, thank you. I mean, for me, I can see the slide that you are talking about, Kate. Yeah. So not sure if some people haven't quite the, the, got the same image as I have, but I would just carry on because I can okay. see what you're referring to. Thank you. There, there are similar. The slides are similar over the next. It's just breaking it down a bit more and a bit more and a bit more. So it's it's building it. Um, so if we continue as we are for the moment, uh, thanks, Haley. Um, so for this last part of the question, I would recommend seeing if you can present it as a table rather than simply more written um, content. So again, be creative. Can we have the next slide, please? And this is what I was referring to earlier about breaking out the instructions of the content. Um, so the instructions, instruction one, provide an organization chart, clearly identifying and you've got to include site and office-based personnel and identifying key operational and administrative contacts. I'm not going to go through all of this because you can see quite clearly there how I have broken out the instructions, the specific instructions that are required by the question. And I do recommend doing it this way because it's so easy 
to forget what the instructions are when you're doing an extensive question. Even, even when you do a short question, it's easy to overlook the specific instruction and get it wrong and then not get the marks that you could have got. Also remember the thousand words instruction. Next slide, please. In terms of content, highlighting in a different color, um, the content that is required. So long and short of this, you've got the instruction and the content all broken out in terms of the questions deconstruction. Once you've got your head around that, um, it should be quite clear and straightforward as to how you're going to, or what you're going to put, and then you should be able to work out how you're going to tackle the, team, the, the, the question. If there's anything in the question that's unclear or it seems to contradict itself, obviously push back, raise a clearly worded clarification question, which can be as simple as, do you mean this or do you mean that? Give the employer the choice of what they mean and then they will say, we mean that or we mean this. So that will help you word your question a bit more easily. Next slide, please. If you want to break it down even more, you can effectively form a tick list, which will help you work through your response and make sure that you don't miss anything out. The worst thing is to get an evaluation after you've submitted your bid and be told that you've missed a part of the question out. It's incredibly frustrating. And obviously, it's a very straightforward loss of marks, which you, where you could have got full marks, but you didn't because you forgot to do something. So that is, in a nutshell, the art of uh, deconstructing, which hopefully should make your question responses easier. Next slide, please. In summary, the key skills, key principles for producing your bid. Analyze the questions and follow the instructions. If the question is broken down into bullet points, make your answer in bullet points. Do exactly what is required in the way that it is required. Allow time. Everything takes time. The organization chart will take time to produce properly, make it look nice, because that matters, and make sure it's accurate. CVs take time to make sure that they are aligned with what the specification requirement is. Everything takes time. You may have to redraft and rewrite if a clarification question provides some information which is not what you thought it meant, including responses to other bidders' clarification questions. It could change the tone of the procurement. And use the mark scheme to guide your writing and indeed to guide your bid or no bid decision. Next slide, please. When you're reviewing your, quest your responses after you've written them, get a second pair of eyes to have a look. You know what you've written, of course you do, and of course it makes perfect sense. But if another person reads it, it may be ambiguous and they may say, well, yeah, you've written this, but what do you mean? Or they may say, well, you've written this, but I can't see how it relates to what the specification is requiring in that area. So do get that second pair of eyes take it on board, take their comments on board, critical friend, whoever that may be, and make sure that you recraft wording, anything that's unclear or that's missed out, um, any content or that's, that's misaligned. We, we get quite a lot of clients that come to us to just simply that second pair of eyes. And it is very interesting to see some areas where they think they've explained it clearly, but actually, it's not as clear as it could be. It's actually a bit ambiguous and you're not sure to, you, personally, I wouldn't give marks there because it's not saying what I wanted to say as an evaluator. It's not saying what I want to read. It's, it's saying something that could mean something completely different. So do, um, do use a second pair of eyes and then obviously save your final version um, before you submit it. Next slide, please. So in summary, the whole process from start to finish is an iterative process as shown here. Um, at the beginning, you have the red bubble of the bid kickoff meeting, which is where you're going to make sure that you're bidding for the right reasons. You can make profit on it. You can deliver what the contract is requiring in the timescales that it is requiring. You've got sufficient staff to deliver it, etc. You're going to go and bid it. You plan your responses, you draft, you review them. You may go round the boy a few times after you've reviewed them, 
all the while you're monitoring the responses to clarification questions as they come in, both yours and other bidders, to keep checking and checking and checking. Is that bid the right bid for your business? There's nothing worse than bidding on a contract and then it turning out to be something completely different. Um, and then ultimately going for submission and hopefully winning the contract. Thank you very much. That's great. Thank you, Kate. So, um, yeah, that's given us a real good feeling for the amount of work that goes into writing one of those excellent winning bids. Um, and it's not something that can be done quickly. It must be quite daunting the first time that a business does it, but I guess the more times they do it and if they're successful at it, the better and quicker it will become. It's never going to be quick or easy. Don't be under any illusions. If you do, if it's quick and easy, there's something wrong. Right. There will always be a bit of pain in it. You need to make sure it is as good, as good, as good as it can be. Um, and that takes time, effort, and most likely a lot of late, late nights. Yeah. But it's worth the price. Hmm. Um, one thing I did want to flag up for members uh, listening to this, that the, earlier on when Nigel talked about make sure you've got your own business strategy clear in your mind on whether a particular opportunity fits with your business strategy. If there are any members here today who are thinking that they need to do a bit more work on that before they go down this route in terms of defining what their business strategy is and what kind of opportunities they're going to look for, FMB is running um, a business coaching program which starts at the end of November. And part of that program is designed to do exactly that, to work with other members and a a construction industry business coach who can help you to define what your business strategy looks like, what success looks like for your business. So we'll send details. There's still a few places left in that program. So we'll send details out with the follow up email. Um, so that's my little plug there for FMB business coaching. I, I wanted to ask um, Nigel and Kate, and if, if anybody attending does have a question still, I see that there aren't any questions in the Q&A box yet, but do type them in right now and we'll, we've will we still got uh, time to answer those if, if you've got any burning questions in your mind. But I wanted to ask you both about the public procurement bill that we know is going through Parliament at the moment um, and what kind of impact do you think that will have on this process? I think it's it's talked about as being something that will simplify public sector procurement, but how do you think that that looks like it will work? Uh, shall I go? Do you want to start and I yeah, chip in? Yeah, okay. Um, well, one of the key objectives of the bill is to make uh, procurement simpler and more transparent. Um, and I think certainly for smaller businesses, public sector procurement can, as Nigel alluded to earlier, it can be very tangled, it can be very bu bureaucratic and onerous. And that I know puts a lot of businesses off. Um, so a clear objective is to um, make it more, more straightforward. Uh, one of the key areas of doing this is to produce um, pipelines in advance so that um, the public, anybody knows what the public sector is going to be um, set, uh, uh, letting out, uh, sending out tenders for in the future. Um, and for small businesses, this is brilliant because it enables you to, as Nigel said earlier, to get your ducks in a row, to prepare and to start thinking about how, how you could best shape your business, how you could best shape your staff and get your resources in a row to um, prepare for that tender before it actually comes out, being proactive rather than reactive. Um, so certainly having a pipeline um, in the public domain across all the public sector is going to be brilliant. Um, I think there will be challenges, certainly the, the increased focus on um, social value and environmental credentials could be quite a challenge for a lot of SMEs. It, it's a challenge enough anyway. Um, untangling that area is, is going to be interesting to, to, um, to look at. Um, and I would recommend any small business in that regard um, to have a look at the public procure notice, procurement notices. Now, there's if you Google PPN 6 stroke 70, that's a um, procurement notice relating to social value. Um, and PPN 6 strokes 
2021 relates to net zero and carbon reduction plans. Um, so those two resources are very useful, potentially very useful for any SME looking to get more familiar with social value requirements and net zero through carbon reduction. Okay, thanks. We'll find those uh, links to those resources, put them in the follow up email as well. Yeah. Sorry, Nigel. Well, and also, can I just add to, to that? I, I think potentially what the idea is that um, whilst value for money will remain a core object, it always will because you're spending public money. So value for money will remain extremely important. But the new regulations in theory will um, require buyers to take a much broader view um, and take into account national priorities and maybe even local priorities as well. So in theory, um, there could be more opportunities for SMEs, provided they get above that quality line. Remember the, the story, the, the man with a van and a barrow is still not going to be successful. Um, you've got to get above that credibility threshold. But I believe that the intention is for more SMEs to have more opportunities with public procurement opportunities. Okay. Do you think that, that that quality piece means that there'll be even more emphasis on the accreditations that you talked about, things like having construction line gold, perhaps having an ISO accreditation or similar? Is that going to become even more important than it is now? Um, potentially. I, I mean, I'll be honest, I've, it, I think it depends on um, what the tender is about and who the customer is. So, for example, if you're if you've got a tender with the MOD, um, it's very likely that you will require um, cyber essentials, for example. And depending on the size of the contract, it may be well be that you do need need ISO nine thousand and one. For smaller contracts, though, I mean, um, we got clients um, locally who, uh, and there's been no requirement so far to have ISO 9001, but they do need to demonstrate they have you know, certain quality pr um, processes in place, but there's been no requirement as yet to, to have ISO 9000. So I think, um, again, and if, if you have a bid where that is a requirement and it's a stated requirement, um, you could always ask a clarification question saying, we don't have it now, but is it acceptable to, um, to have it in place by the start of the contract? And so you can always put it in place if you are successful. Yeah. So I wouldn't necessarily think that it's a, you need to, to get on the starting block, you need to have ISO 9001. I think it's dependent on the specific sector and types of contract you're going for. Right. So it could, it could be yeah. something that you're working towards in some situations rather than already got. Yeah, that, absolutely. I think that, that's okay. perfectly valid. Yeah. yeah. Mm. I Sorry. think that's absolutely right. Um, in terms of uh, the, the key words are scale and complexity, that the um, the quality requirements in terms of accreditations, like insurance, will be commensurate with the scale and complexity of the tender. Um, and I think the employers are very well aware that they can't expect things like ISO accreditations, which cost sometimes quite a lot of money to get put in place, if the contract is really not worth that the amount of money or it's not really relevant um so it would be an unrealistic expectation mm. okay i think it's also worth saying that, that local certainly local authorities uh, and and for the most part other government bodies as well they they want a competitive environment with as many bidders as they realistically can so they're not in the business of excluding people um, so, it, and they would encourage, certainly local authorities would encourage small businesses to have a go at, um, at, their, at, their, at their, their, their tenders uh, wherever, wherever possible. So I think they're in the, in the they're, wherever they can, they will be reducing barriers, not putting them up, it is, is our experience. Well, that's an encouraging thought for our members to have in mind, isn't it? That's great. Where, where do you think that um, their FMB and potentially if their FMB and Trustmark registered members, where would those accreditations sit within a, a bid? I mean, I assume that it will be something worth mentioning in the in the proposal that they're putting forward. Would that sit with the accreditations piece or do they just weave it in where where it's appropriate, depending on the bid? The, there is always a question on quality, your quality framework, your quality assurance, quality standards um, in the extended response. Um, personally, I would put it in there. Um, 
in the supplier questionnaire, sometimes there are um, or there's a requirement to list the um, accreditations, etc., that you have. So you can pop it in there as well. But in any quality response, I would certainly put it in there. Mm. Okay. Um, a member asked me the other day whether it was a good idea, whether it was worthwhile to build up a relationship with local procurement officers in their local authority um, team. You know, I don't know how you would set about doing that, but uh, it would presumably be a good thing if the procurement officers knew of your business and, and had met you and, and all of that, because it would make your bid stand out from the crowd, wouldn't it? Well, that they're not allowed to use any knowledge of you during the evaluation process. That is an absolute no-no. It's effectively as if your bid is anonymized. Building a relationship with a procurement person so that you understand how they work and what their what are their hot buttons, what really are they looking for in tenders when they're evaluating or what's coming out to market is a really positive thing to do. And also procurement officers, I was at a meeting the other day uh, from, from a procurement team and they really welcome um, approaches from businesses, local businesses, as Nigel said, they, they always look to expand it's part of the value agenda. They're looking to expand their, their um, network of suppliers so that they can constantly get the best value. A new supplier is potentially one who can offer better value, better quality than their current list of suppliers. So in developing these relationships is a very positive thing, but um, I would not recommend relying on them to give any form of advantage in a tender at all, um, not least because that would be almost verging on corrupt. Um, it, it's not sensible to rely on a relationship in a tender like that. I, I would, um, it, it's, it's not an easy thing to do. And I think it's a, it's a marathon, not a sprint. So if you develop these relationships over a long period of time by getting to, and I would attend, for example, buyers events. I would attend all of those if whenever you get the opportunity and little by little, you get to understand um, how your, let's say, local authority works. You get to know various people there and uh, you, you you see the word on the streets. Read their websites. Re read the local authorities' websites. What What is important to the, the local authority? And you st and read the newspaper, you know, um, understand what's going on locally. Um, and you get a lot of clues as to what Kate said, what the hot buttons are. Um, and I would, you know, I would use that approach. The sort of indirect approach is often is often best. But um, a blatant, can we meet for coffee is probably, you know, you've got, it's, I, I would, I would use their processes and their, their way of um, developing relationships rather than sort of going full frontal and trying to get in the front door, because that might not be successful. So it's kind of quite a subtle process, I would suggest. Yeah, um, we we seem to have temporarily lost Haley, but I'm just spotting there's a question come in from Graham Wicks. Um, in what ways can an SME demonstrate their sustainability and social value on a tender? Um, there will be a question on social value, which will be between 10 and 20 percent of the whole score. In terms of social value, if we take that one first, um, depending on the tender, the um, employer may have specific identified priorities that it releases as part of the documents um, and it, it requires the bidder to show alignment. So it may be, for example, um, developing employability in the local economy and, and adding to skills in the local area. Um, so you would need to show how you're going to contribute to the development of local skills, which could, for example, be example be um, giving um, career days or careers events at local sixth form colleges or, or schools. Um, it could be um, having apprentices within your team, having a certain number of apprentices a year, um, things like that. Um, in terms of sustainability, um, you can look at how you um, use energy on your premises, whether you're using um, renewable energy, what sort of vehicles you have, um, are you using um, zero emission or low emission vehicles, um, and that sort of thing. Um, Nigel, can you think yeah, of anything else say, about sustainability? I, I would say 
waste, uh, your arrangements for waste and recycling are, are, are important to be able to articulate uh, yeah. that um, is as well. Yeah. So um, there's there's quite a lot of um, stuff about that. Um, if, Graham, certainly if you if you're interested and want to, to get in touch with us separately, we can we can follow that up and point you give um, signposts you point you into um, some directions and some information. Um, so please feel free to to do that. As another question come up uh, from Nicola de Souza following this conversation about talking to procurement teams. Um, Essex County Council are really keen to support SMEs and have formed a construction alliance, including the FMB, running events to help businesses learn up and coming opportunities and how to get involved. I recommend joining that if members are local. The last meeting included conversations about social value. Yes, so that's that's really useful, Essex County Council. I went to um, Yeovil um, the other day for a meeting with Somerset um, District Council, which was very, very, very similar, um, where the procurement team, it wasn't specifically about construction, but it was opening a door to uh, local organisations and talking about social value. So yes, thank you, Nicola, for that. I'm sure um, people attending will be interested in that. Um, are there any other um, questions that anyone would like to pop into chat so we can... Um, Talk about those. Q &A. Haley's internet has disappeared, which is why she's suddenly. It okay. doesn't look like there are any more questions. Right. Okay. Well, I think I think I think, I think, I think on behalf it. of Haley. Yeah, that's it. Thank thank you very much for attending. I hope you found that useful, um, and I think that this is going to be out on the FMB website in due course. And I think a copy of um, our slides in PDF are going to be available for people as well. So thank you very much for yes. your attention. Uh, I hope you found it useful. Yes, thank uh, you. Th thanks all. Yes, hope you found it useful. Um, and if you require any further tips, obviously, drop us a line. Okay, thanks thank very you. much. Bye -bye.